It is good to have you once again on Crunch Econometrics. Thank you for joining me on this, our gauge modeling series. Now we proceed to estimate a simplified gauge model. Our objective is to forecast the volatility of returns of the full stock. Now, these are the steps to estimating a simple gauge model. Load your data, plot the series for visualization, proceed to test for arch effects, if arch effects are present, estimate a GACH model, interpret your results, and perform diagnostics. I have slated diagnostics testing as a separate video. Therefore, I will not be performing any diagnostics in this particular video. The data I'll be using for this series is from Asterio and Hall. I have indicated the link to that data in the video description. Can you click on that link and look for the arch.wf1 data? I also have this link on my website. If you need it, click on my website. I have also the link in the data description. But in this case, you have to shop for it and put it in a cart and check out. Although it is at zero cost. This file is free on my website. So click on the link. Put it in your, in your shopping basket and check out at zero cost. So if you're ready, you can also use your data to practice along. I would prefer that you use your data anyway so that you can see how your results turn out as you follow my steps. So ready? Let's start crunching. So now I'm in Avius interface. This is the series I'm working with, the returns to full stock. I double click on it. And here I have the series listed from 1985, January, to 31st December, 1999. So this is the entire range of the series. But let me quickly tell you that my sample is a reduced sample. So you can see from the work file, I've limited my sample from 1990 to 1999. So I'm not using the entire range, okay? So this is the entire range from 1985 to 1999. But my sample is a reduced sample from 1990 to 1999. So first thing we have to do is to plot the series for visualization. So to do that, we go to view, click on graph, line and symbol, click OK. Remember, one of the stylus facts of the GACH model, similar to the ARCH model, is that it evidences volatility clustering of the series. So here you can see periods of large changes followed by large changes and periods of small changes being followed by small changes. So volatility clustering is evident in this series. And you can see mean reversion. Yes, why volatility is yes, but it reverts back to its mean. At zero, you can see there's a reversion here. So this series is a stationary series which exhibits volatility clustering. Again, let's do another thing. Let's look at um, the histogram plot. Histogram and stats, as expected, is clearly leptocortic. It has fat tails, which is a clear feature of financial series. High frequency series often exhibit fat tails. And the returns to full steel stock is not an exception. So we can see here it is leptocortic because the tails are fat. So this is what I just showed you now. The trend of the series shows volatility clustering, and you can see that the series is clearly leptocortic. So, stylized facts is also proven to be the case in the return to the FTSE. The next thing is to test for arch effects before we can estimate a GACH model. But I'm going to skip that so you can watch my video on arch modeling to see how you can test for arch effects. Okay? So, I'm going to assume that arch effects exist in this model. So now I proceed to estimate a GACH model. So to estimate a GACH model, we go to quick. We click on estimate equation. And we type the variable. Is the return to the full state? C, constant, and the lagged value of the return to the full state. So here I put a minus one in brackets. So here we have the return to the full state, a constant, and the first lag of the returns to the full stock. I come to methods, I change it from least squares 
and I select Arch. This new dialog box opens. Make sure that your information is correct. First check your sample, that you are using the correct sample. In my case, yes, it's from January 1990 to December 31st, 1999, which is okay. Again, check this information. You must have H1 and GACH1 because we are estimating a GACH1-1 model, so this is fine. We are not estimating a threshold GACH, so this one remains zero. We click on options. And I'm following Astro and Hall, so I'm going to change my optimization method to EDU's legacy. So that's the only thing I'm changing in the options tab. I go back to specification and I leave every other thing the way they are. The error construct I'm using is the normal Gaussian. Everything is fine. I click OK. So here, this is our result for the GACH 1 1 model. Let's see whether this results meet all specifications. So I'm going to move over now to PowerPoint where I have copied and pasted this result for clearer explanation. So you can see what I estimated. I'm just showing you the equation dialog box. Make sure that you try to follow my um, steps and just adapt what I did. So here we have the results of what we just estimated. The dependent variable is the return to the FUSI. Um, convergence was achieved after 13 iterations. My total observations, 2610, which is okay. The more observations you have, the better for you. The output is divided into two parts. We have the upper and the lower parts. So let me start to interpret the upper part of the table, which is the main equation. If we look at the coefficients, they are positive. And from the p-values, they are statistically significant at the 1% level. The C here represents the average stock return of the FUSI stock. And its past value is very significant at 0 0.063. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the past value of the stock significantly predicts the current value. So the past value here has a very strong predictive um, ability on the current stock of the FTSE. And again, 0 0.000433 represents the average stock of the stock. Both coefficients are very significant at the 1% level. The coefficients of the constant variance term, which is this, the H term, which is this one, 0 0.051 is the H term, and the GACH term, which is 0 0.94, are positive and statistically significant at the 1% level from the p-values here. So both coefficients are also positive. So this gives us the result of the GACH model. The time-varying volatility in this case, as you can see, includes a constant plus a lagged value of the um, conditional variance and a lagged value of the squared error, both of which are positive. And if you sum them together, they are less than 1. And as you can see from here, beta 1 lies between 0 and 1, positive, and theta 1 lies between 0 and 1, also positive. And the sum of both coefficients are less than 1. This satisfies our stability condition. So endeavor you check out the signs of the arch and gauge terms to see whether they satisfy the stability conditions. I'm going to leave out these specification results. I will address them in the video under diagnostics. So what do we conclude? from the results of the simple GACH 1-1 model. These findings clearly establish the presence of time-varying conditional volatility of the returns to the full stock. This result also indicates that the persistence of volatility shocks as represented by the sum of the H and GACH terms is large. If you add beta 1 and theta 1, you have 0 0.99. So the persistence of volatility shocks in this model is large. It also denotes 
that the effect of today's shock remains in the forecast of variance for many periods in the future. So if you are working on any gatch paper at this moment, you can just adapt or modify my interpretation to suit your results. Now, let us see whether a parsimonious gatch model will do better than an overparameterized gatch model. So I'm going back to e-views and I'm going to increase the number of gatch terms and arch terms to six. So let's see what the outcome will look like. I click on estimate. And here I increase arch to six. I increase gatch to six and I click OK. So let's take a look at these results and what do we observe? We can see clearly the majority of the coefficients are statistically not significant. Only very few coefficients are significant. Another thing you will observe is that some of these coefficients have negative signs. Negative signs. So clearly you can see that when a model is overparameterized, it weakens its predictive ability. So by my judgments, a GAT66 model will behave very poorly. Let us try a model, a GAT16 um, model, whereby we have one GAT term and six arch terms. And let's compare our results. So I click on estimate. I modify our GAT term now to one. I leave the arch term the way it is at six. Every other thing remains the way they are, and I click OK. So this is a GAT16 model. One six model in the sense that I have just one term of the lagged conditional variance and six lag terms for the squared error. So let's look at our findings. We have four coefficients here not significant, and we have two coefficients here negative, though they are not significant. So by my judgment and by all indications, remember one of the reasons why the GATCH model is an improvement over the ARCH is because including too many parameters weaken the predictive ability of the model and it may result in some of the coefficients being negative. So we have seen it here as our outcome. So both GATCH66 model and a GATCH16 model, they are both behave purely when you compare uh, them to a GATCH. 1-1 one, one model. So here we have them on the screen. I showed you earlier, this from GAT66, six, six, several coefficients not significant, and four are negative. The GAT16 model, two coefficients are negative, and about four coefficients not significant. So my conclusion is that a GAT11 one, one model behaves better than these two. So try to make your model as parsimonious as possible. It doesn't make any sense when you're estimating a GAT44 model, a GAT34 model, and your results are negative or not significant. Try to create a parsimonious model as much as you can. That will be all in this video. Please check out these readings and papers, several papers on GAT modeling and its extension, very interesting papers, just to strengthen your understanding and to support it with my video that you have just watched. So now I have concluded uh, the third video, which is on how to estimate a simple GATCH model. So far, three videos have been covered, video one, video two, and this is the third one. By way of advice, please do not skip any of these videos, watch them in sequential order to solidify or understand it. I appreciate your support for staying with me and for the comments I've received so far since I began this GATCH modeling series. Thank you. They are all encouraging comments. And for those of you who are sharing my links to your students and to your colleagues, I appreciate you all. Thank you for the support. Join me on my Facebook group. The links are all there. Join me on Twitter. Let's interact together so that we can learn together. Please don't go away. I'll be right back with the next video which is to compare the arch and gatch models in estimation.